All right, hi, my name is Chris Jordan, and this is my report on the transition from lungfish to amphibians and reptiles. All right, for ages, the evolutionary line of amphibians and reptiles has been very heatedly discussed, as there is no one clear and for sure answer. One of the most talked about possibilities for the ancestors of these creatures is the lungfish. This has been heavily linked to herpetology, studies of reptiles and amphibians, because the idea that lungfish are the sole ancestors of the tetrapods. Tetrapods are four-legged giants, which we know as dinosaurs, that roamed the earth hundreds of millions of years ago. Not only were they able to propel themselves along the ground with their fins, but it also taken clean air on land, allowing them to both survive in terrestrial and aquatic territories. Two species of lungfish most currently reside in Australia, with a third in Queensland. Using these living fossils, a group of scientists successfully traced the evolution back to the ancient times of the dinosaurs, claiming that because of this, the lungfish must be the closest living species. These recordings were then compared to other bony species of fish, the zebrafish and the American paddlefish, both of which bear resemblances to the lungfish in reference to their vertebrae. These discoveries show that because of the correlation in their vertebrae, a muscle formation mechanism has been developed which serves as a stepping stone between a shark and their fins to eventually the hind legs of a tetrapod. Millions of years ago, giant land-dwelling reptiles ruled the earth when it was still relatively young. These majestic creatures would become to known as dinosaurs, the first tetrapods. Dinosaurs are most prominent during the Jurassic period, when the seven continents we know and recognize today were still assembled into one supercontinent called Pangaea. This wouldn't last for long, though, because as Pangaea slowly started to drift apart and the dinosaurs would begin to deteriorate, eventually becoming extinct for reasons we are still trying to explain today. During the Jurassic, however, aquatic and land animals of all sorts would thrive in a very hot and dry environment where many mammals and larger reptiles could not cope in the period prior called the Triassic. In addition to the dinosaurs, many other animals similar to current species evident in today's world also existed, such as sharks, the first rays, giant marine crocodiles, as well as various species of fish, underwater plants, and even the first dinosaur-like bird, known as Archaeopteryx. However, the end of the Jurassic would come to a sad close as the giant tetrapods would die out in a mass extinction, in addition to some of the marine mount reptiles and bivalves. What caused this extinction is still a mystery today, but huge methane deposits that were triggered at the time of the extinction seem to be related somehow. This would then lead to the creation of the lungfish, as the large tetrapods would have to learn to adapt to their new environment and defend for themselves. This has led to the large ancient creatures turning into sea, or turning to the sea, and growing a pair of gills and lungs in order to start a new life underwater. Lungfish have an extremely similar spine to that of dinosaur, so this series seems like a very promising one. Since lungfish are derived from large four-legged lizard-like animals, it is strongly indicative, or indicative that they have once adapted to a different environment and taken the land once again, except this time they are much smaller and are known as the modern-day amphibians and reptiles. Most people in the world, when the word amphibian is mentioned, they jump to the thought of animals such as frogs, toads, newts, and salamanders. In all actuality, though, amphibians are separated into three main groups, or clades, known as the Sicilians, the Salamanders, and Frogs, the most well-known. Sicilians most resemble that of an earthworm, even that of a snake. They have long, skinny torso that lack legs, and their heads and tails are both bullet-shaped and most known for burrowing into the ground, like most earthworms also do. Salamanders, however, are labeled with the name Caudata and Urudella, which each mean, respectively, having tail and tail visible. They are also known for having very tall and long bodies, long tails, distinct heads and necks, and well-developed limbs. Although many salamanders have been known to have reduced the limbs or even missing hind limbs altogether, salamanders of many types exist in the world, including those who burrow and species um, that are even aquatic. A forest salamander that lives high up in canopies even exists in certain climates. Finally, most well-known, the frog is the last clade of amphibian, whose known base name means without tail and jumping and they are unlike any other vertebrates in the kingdom. Even though they retain larger and rounder bodies with a continuous head, their legs, hind limbs, are generally twice as long as the body, and they are able to leap incredible distances given their small frame. Uh, not all frogs jump, though, as some are completely aquatic. Others that roam around on land merely walk all the time. Among all the amphibians, the frog is known as the one with the highest diversity and the broadest geographically. As far as reproduction goes, Almost all amphibians require freshwater to lay eggs. One dozen of eggs have been, once dozens of eggs have been laid, they retain inside of the water until they hatch and reach the tadpole phase, which serves as a miniature version of frog or salamander, etc. 
Many amphibians go through the development phase quite differently, though. In some cases, the species will remain inside of the egg until they have completed the tadpole, tadpole phase, while some others, the like the poison dart frog, will carry the younglings until they arrive at a specific place where the eggs can go through metamorphosis. The amphibian has many ways that it can go through the whole parenting phase. Lastly, we have the mighty reptiles, which also consist of only three clades. Turtles, archosaurs, and lepidosaurs. Like frogs, the turtle species cannot be mistaken for another, and they are known by the known base name of testudines, which means tortoises. It's not a coincidence. The turtle's body, most notably, is encased by an upper and lower bony shell, which acts as a makeshift shield protecting the turtle inside from any dangers, such as predators. Turtles are also have an extremely broad spectrum of species, where they can either be fully terrestrial, such as a tortoise, or aquatic, like sea turtles. Small as a mouse or big as a giant, and can even be carnivorous, which means they only eat meat, or herbivorous, which is only plants. Next are the archosaurs, which are represented by a crocodile, and some, even some birds. Yes, I said birds, but that's a different topic. Crocodilians are also called by the name Crocodilia, which happens to be Latin for lizard. The crocodilians happen to be protected by a thick hide like armor, have an elongated tail, head, and torso, all while retaining small and stubby yet incredibly strong legs. Crocodilians are a pretty small group of semi aquatic reptiles that are naturally at the top of the food chain, whose tail allows them to swim because of very powerful strokes, yet they are not nearly as mobile on land, often not staying long on earth due to nesting and eating habits. Lastly, the Lepidosaurs are consumed mainly of only tartaras, snakes, and lizards, and referred to by the name Sphenodontida or wedge tooth. This group includes some of the most diverse and dangerous of the reptiles, with habitats ranging from tropical oceans to temperate mountaintops, and everywhere in between. They all have different bodies and forms, and can either be terrestrial or aquatic. Snakes can be especially dangerous, and they are more more than often poisonous, and confronting one without immediate help could spell doom for just about anyone. Reptiles are generally reproduced sexually, although some are able to produce by themselves asexually. After engaging in sexual activity, most reptiles will lay amniotic eggs that will have a leathery shell. After this, it depends of the species as to what happens to the egg. Some will keep the eggs until right before hatching, while other reptiles will provoke maternal treatment to the egg to make sure that the yolk is fully nourished. One, inter one interesting aspect of the reptilian egg is that some exhibit signs of TDSD, or temperature-dependent sex determination, where depending on the incubation, incubation temperature, the baby can be predetermined to be either male or female. This happens most commonly in turtles and crocodiles, but has also been prevalent in some lizards and tartaras, but not yet in a snake. In order to understand what may have fully happened to the tetrapod lungfish over the millions of years, you must first understand the final outcome. The amphibians and reptiles of today's world exhibit very similar characteristics to the mentioned lungfish, and especially to age-old dinosaurs. While no evidence has been found to directly link this theory, this does seem to be one of the more promising and interesting theories in the academic community at the moment. It almost seems that the only thing standing in the way of this theory being proven is finding one strand of ancestral evidence. Alright, that's the end of my video, and I thank you all for watching.